For today's closing general session, please welcome our power panel speakers on the future of investment management, George Gatch, CEO of J.P. Morgan Funds, and Bob Reynolds, President and CEO of Putnam Investments, as well as our moderator, CEO of Brightscope, Mike Alfred. <laughs> So my name is Mike Alfred, uh, co-founder, CEO of Brightscope, and I'm happy to be joined on stage today by two guys that I think are really uh, tremendous leaders, respected leaders in the space of investment management. Uh, we've got Bob Reynolds, president and CEO of Putnam, uh, a Boston-based asset manager with $141 billion uh, under management, as well as George Gatch, uh, CEO of J.P. Morgan Funds, uh, an asset management firm uh, with about 500 billion under management based in New York, and they manage about 500 billion of JP Morgan's 1.3 trillion globally. Um, so I want to start uh, right off the bat with a, a topic that I think everybody's sort of aware of, and that is the growth of indexed or passive investing. Um, so, you know, a lot of folks have been looking at the success of BlackRock's iShares business, uh, Vanguard's uh, business, and their franchise over time. Uh, there's also been a, a lot of research, academic research, research from firms like Morningstar that have pointed to the fact that for uh, a long period of time, uh, if you're going to invest for 20 or 30 years, uh, one of the best predictors, according to them, of course, is uh, the amount that you're paying in fees. So, Bob, what are people missing um, in this index passive uh, argument, and why won't index solutions sort of take over the planet going forward? Well, there's still a tremendous amount of value to be active, added to active management. Every index in itself has a bias, and you have to understand what that bias is. If you're investing in the S&P 500, there's a sector bias, there's a large cap bias because it's cap weighted, and if those are in favor, indexes do well. But if those are not in favor, active management can add tremendous, tremendous value. And I think that's the pursuit out there to add value to fundamental research or quantitative and to add value to the index on a consistent basis over time. Index funds have been around for 20 plus years at least. And uh, everyone's always said, oh, this is the end of uh, active management, but active managers continue to do extremely, extremely well in the marketplace. And speaking to that, uh, George, JP Morgan's been one of the only sort of pure play active managers in recent years on a net flows basis to actually gather uh, quite a bit of assets. So, so why do you think JP Morgan's continue to be successful even in an environment that's been somewhat challenging for other active managers? Well, I, I think I just want to also add to Bob's comments. You know, I think the, you know, indexing is here to stay. It is going to an important large part of the industry. There's roughly $22 trillion in mutual funds around the world. 70% of it, though, is still in active management. And in our lifetimes, it is likely to continue to be the majority, simply because investors, um, like all of us, want to do better than average. Um, and they will continue to seek managers who have proven track records, investment processes. Um, if you invest in an index fund, you will receive an index return minus the fees, and in some cases, depending on the type of indice, it's actually very difficult uh, for indexers to actually equal um, the underlying, underlying market. So our strategy as a firm has been um, to exclusively focus on active management. Um, and we employ one of the largest uh, networks of buy-side research analysts, 800 people around the world, um, who are um, solely looking for opportunities for, for, our, for our clients. We've been very successful in um, spite of very difficult volatile markets and uh, a period of time where um, index funds have taken significant share. And we have because of, um, one, the breadth of the capabilities which we're able to offer. Um, and you have to, as an active manager, fulfill the promise that you're making to investors, 
which is to provide um, um, uh, the potential and historical track records of producing excess returns on behalf of client. First and foremost, that is the most important thing for the success of our business is um, the quality of the investment results that we produce. However, I would say that the world um, um, also needs ways to help people uh, navigate in a very volatile, complex world. So in addition to great investment capabilities, our strategy is to provide insights into capital markets to help investors understand and make decisions based on facts, not emotion. Uh, and the delivery of our intellectual capital and helping people understand how to take advantage of opportunities in the marketplace um, is a really important part of our strategy, and I think it's created um, um, a level of confidence and trust in our investment capabilities that is only there because of the context in which we can help financial advisors and their clients develop and implement a long-term investment strategy. Something that's been out there lately is that it's all about cost. Mm -hmm. And the real cost to any investor is the return net of fees, and there has been study after study that cost it by itself means nothing. It's how much have you returned to the investor? And I think that's what some people have forgot about. Let's talk a little bit about uh, financial advisors. So uh, when you look at a firm like Putnam, you guys sell almost exclusively. 100%. 100% through financial advisors. Right. And so, you know, when you look at this crowd, there are a lot of venture capitalists here who have invested in these exciting new firms that are going to revolutionize investment management on the web, firms like Wealthfront and Betterment. Uh, how do you think the role of the advisor needs to change to reflect kind of the way the market is moving and the fact that technology is increasingly enabling more of the investment process? Well, the ability for inspection in everything in life has gotten much greater as information flow has overtaken everything, every part of our lives. So every individual has more information when they're making investment decisions, working with advisors, et cetera. So I think that's been a big change. However, if you look at the mutual fund industry, and that's where people have chosen to invest, low cost, diversification, liquidity, transparency, all the good reasons, that's where people have chosen to, to invest. It's, it's all been because of choice and performance over time, and that's what draws people to that investment. Okay, uh, let's talk about product and distribution sides of the house, because if you want to simplify an asset management firm into two sides, you've got you know, a portfolio management team, with analysts, uh, looking for opportunities, building a strategy, uh, trying to basically create a track record. Um, on the other side, you have a team that basically takes that product track record and, and markets it, makes sure that people can, can access it. Has one of those two sides of the house become more important recently, in your opinion? Well, I, you know, I would say, like lots of organizations, there's always a um, uh, friction between the sales and trading side of an investment bank or um, the marketers and the engineers in a, in, a, in a car company. And it's not dissimilar in an asset, in an asset management firm that um, there is, you know, in a sense, a, a very uh, um, um, active debate between those two sides of the organization. And, and I think what you've seen happen is that the, to be successful in the asset management business, you have to have strong investment talent. Um, and um, that is a precursor to everything. Strong investment re returns, uh, the intellectual capital of um, the best and brightest of people who can identify opportunities for clients. But the world has changed very fundamentally in that the, the, the asset management business is becoming more and more like other industry segments where other competencies are becoming very important for our success. Uh, marketing, technology, um, digital tools and, and capabilities. And uh, so I do think there is a, in some ways a resetting 
of um, the relationship between the man manufacturing side, the portfolio management teams, and the distribution teams. Distribution is becoming more and more important because there are, it is so competitive on the investment side. For any you know, large cap equity strategy, um, there are 400 funds in the US marketplace which are top quartile um, at any moment in time. How does a firm distinguish itself um, when it has strong investment performance? And those other competencies um, are becoming much more important. And I think, frankly, the asset management industry is catching up with the consumer products industry, with other areas of the financial service industry, which have had to invest in these other components of their business much more significantly than asset management firms have historically. Bob, you want to add to that? No, I, I wholeheartedly agree. I think it's, um, it's one where you have to hit on all cylinders. In other words, you can have the best performance in the world, but if you have poor marketing distribution, your product's not going to be sold. If you have great sales and marketing, but have bad products, you're not going to sell. So it's, it takes a contribution across the firm. So that's why you try to be best in class as George said, in asset management, best in class in marketing, best web presence, best you know wholesalers. So it's it's a combination. Now, in terms of technology, you've invested a lot of money in technology in recent years at, at Putnam on the participant side, right, to help retirement plan participants see their accounts, understand uh, what's happening inside of it. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, w w what we're trying to do is in the whole discussion around retirement is getting people to realize that they need to save on a continual basis, invest, et cetera. And so many times the past discussion would present someone with a pie chart, this is what it looks like, or I love the commercial where someone's carrying around, you need $2.2 .2 million. And if you tell a 30-year-old that, you're gonna lose them. So what we, we approached it saying, okay, at the rate you're saving and make assumptions, you're gonna have this as a paycheck when you retire, which is 80% of your final year paycheck or 70% if you're not saving enough. And just through moving the dials, people can change the way they save. The greatest determinant of retirement success is the contribution level. And how do, we get, how do we get people to save more? Well, you, you just show them what is the impact. And I think one of the great things about baby boomers, being one, I can say that, is that you're going to hear a lot of success stories and you're going to hear a lot of horror stories. And it's going to be the, the challenge to all Americans going forward is they have a responsibility to provide for their retirement. And I think through workplace savings, it's been proven time and time again through workplace savings, people definitely save for retirement at a much greater level than if they don't have it. Now both uh, JP Morgan and Putnam are leaders in the retirement plan space, both as record keepers like Fidelity that offer kind of a bundled product as well as uh, funds, right, sold on other record keeping platforms. So from J.P. Morgan's perspective and your perspective, what is the biggest sort of challenge in the retirement marketplace today? I, I think the challenge in the retirement marketplace, and I think Bob's comment, the savings rates and contributions are a critical component of it. But I, I think the asset management industry overall has made things very complex for people. Um, and it's one of the reasons that financial advisors are such a critical part of the industry is, is it's so confusing. Um, and if you look at 401k plans, it's a perfect example of the complexity that we have um, put in front of, of individuals. The average 401k plan has 22 options available. Um, the average participant employee in a plan selects three and a half options. Inevitably, they are, tend to select perhaps those options at the wrong time, or not as diversified enough. And I think the challenge for the asset management industry and the retirement industry is to simplify choice. More choice does not necessarily mean better decisions in more diversified options. That's where target date funds, um, the simplifi simplification of 
menu options available. To, so, so participants are making better decisions when they're in the plan, um, which I think is such a critical part. Not only do we need to get people to save and create a culture of saving and contributing to your 401k plan, but enhance the quality of decisions by simplifying options and decisions by participants. Yeah, when you look at uh, target dates, which, which have exploded in the 401k space, what you're talking about is packaged advice, because it's global, for most time, is global asset allocation pursuant to your age. So it is advice, and it's helping people to invest the right way, and uh, I think that's one of the great things. The Pension Protection Act of 2006 made the default option either target dates or balance funds. It used to be because a plan sponsor was worried about the liability, they would default to the most conservative option, which if you're a young investor, that is the riskiest option. So I, I think target dates have been a huge uh, benefit to the in industry. So I'm gonna ask one more question and then we're gonna open it up to Q&A. So if you have questions, uh, come up to the microphone. Uh, Bob, you were one of the first asset management CEOs on Twitter. Um, not too many folks in our industry are, are using that platform. Some people might consider that kind of a lighter weight platform, but uh, how have you found the experience of, of being on Twitter and also where, do you, where else are you going to make uh, investments of your time in terms of technology going forward? Yeah, I, I think we look at all mediums of uh the, the whole social media. I think Twitter was an easy one because you can get out there with short bleeps, you can uh, get messages out about markets, business, and also you can get feedback very, very easily. And I, I'll never forget the first day I said, I want to tweet, and they go, well, the attorneys will get involved. I said, no, tomorrow. So uh, we, I'd get out there, I've got 5,000 followers now, and it's, 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 it's worked great for us. Enjoy it. You've made a number of investments in technology recently. Yeah, I think it's, a, I, again, I think it's an area that the asset management industry is behind, um, you know, other, other industries. It's so critical in the way that, that we think about it is that the experience that an investor has with us um, we want that to be replicated in an individual meeting with a salesperson in one of our events and extended to the digital world. Um, we have launched a number of um, apps that are designed to help financial advisors um, work with clients uh, to present um, information on markets and what's happening. Um, we, we have um, launched a number of things on YouTube um, where we're using our intellectual capital um, um, to, for, for financial advisors. Um, we, have, uh, we have a number of programs that we're, that we're working to really focus less on the number of followers um, on Twitter or LinkedIn, but really who the followers are. You know, increasingly advertising dollars, I think, in our industry are not as effective as they used to be. So finding the influencers using Twitter, using LinkedIn to um, take our, our strength, our intellectual capital, and deliver it in ways um, outside of the products that we're selling, totally independent from, from products because it's not a product sale, it's a, it's a, um, a, a, a expansion of our uh, uh, intellectual capital through these types of forums. A very important investment for us. Do we have any questions um, right now or should I keep going? Any questions from the audience? Any ringers? Anyone from competitors, how about that? <laughs> Let's go to globalization because I want to talk about that given JP Morgan's uh, focus there. Can you talk a little bit about what you're doing globally and what you think is going to happen Emerging markets, developed markets, um, which firms are going to win, win and lose? Yeah, it's, it's an area that the, um, I think the U.S.-based asset management firms have a, such a distinct advantage because of the scale of the U.S. marketplace. And because, of, you know, the U.S. mutual fund industry is $13 trillion, it's more than half of the total um, in global assets. So the U.S. firms, and because of the quality of the, um, of the U.S. industry in terms of transparency, governance, fees, 
Um, I think it, the U.S. firms have the potential um, to be the big winners as the industry globalizes, which it is very rapidly. Um, and you can tell from capital flows into funds, uh, the biggest selling sun in the U.S. tends to be the same in Europe and the same in Asia, and they tend to be the big asset management firms, U.S.-based, that are increasingly, increasingly um, winning and taking, and taking market share. And I think it's so critical because of the wealth that's being produced outside of the U.S. This will be the first year that there is more um, wealth in Asia than there is in, in the United States. Um, GDP growth will be significantly higher. There's going to be a tidal wave of, uh, of wealth produced in Asia and the emerging markets. Our target market is the middle class. More than half of the middle class will be in the emerging markets by 2020. Uh, really critical for our industry to be winners, and I think the U.S. firms um, have, um, have a leg up. Yeah, I, I, I would just add to that that if you were just U.S.-centric, you would want to have research people around the world in emerging markets because U.S. companies, that's where they're selling over half their products. So I, I think it's a, uh, almost the cost of doing business now. We, we have investment offices around the world, but I, I think it's valuable in the fact that what you have is globalization of markets, information, com competition, you know, auto companies are global industry, drug companies are global industries. So the market itself has forced, uh, I think, managers to go global, but uh, it makes all the sense in the world, even if you were just investing in the U.S. Right. right. So I know you've got to fly out to uh, London. I know you're taking off. So thank you for being here today and sharing this time with the audience. My pleasure. We, we, we made an attempt to bring a new subject matter to to a payments conference, and I think um, we'll have to explore whether or not we can really bring together at Money 2020, I think, a lot of different folks that exist within the financial services industry. But uh, thank you all for taking the time to be here today, and, and have a good rest of the conference. Thank you very thank much. You.